All right, good evening, church family. Happy Wednesday to you. We have, uh, on Wednesday nights, we've been walking through a sermon series just talking about, about pride. What is so awful about pride? Pride is the hindrance to coming to faith in Jesus Christ. It is pride that gets in the way. And so we have began, we've been walking through, I spent uh, three or four weeks and we began by looking at the vertical relationship, like what pride does to our relationship with God. And pride says that we want to step out from underneath God's authority, okay? He's the creator and we are dependent beings, but that doesn't matter, okay? Uh, He's the king and he is holy, but we want to declare our own truths, He is even the loving father or husband that pursues us. He is the father that has given his son for us, okay? This is all what's so awful about pride because we want to step out in our own authority from underneath his authority. But then last week we began to talk about that once we step out from underneath his authority, that it it leads a void in our soul. And, and we always try and find something to fill that void. And it leads us on this search to fill that void. And now, uh, today, we're going to talk about the, the way that pride begins to affect us on the horizontal level. All right, we've stepped out from underneath, but now on the horizontal level, and I want, I want you to read with me, it'll be on the screen, in Luke chapter 18. Jesus begins to press with a parable. We're going to spend two weeks going over this parable, but listen to what it says, Luke 18, beginning in verse 9, and he also told this parable, that's Jesus, to some people, listen to what it says, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Verse 10. This is Jesus' parable. Two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was not even, uh, was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went to his house justified rather than the Pharisee. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. All right, so going into the parable in verse 9, the scripture literally tells us why Jesus told the parable, right? Flip back to to verse 9. It says, "Because, because people were trusting in their own righteousness, and viewing others with contempt. So we're gonna focus on this first part today and we're gonna come back next week. We're gonna talk about how pride causes us next week to view others with contempt. But this week we're gonna talk about how pride causes us to trust in our own righteousness. So when you go through the parable, the Pharisee, right, he, he, was, he was pretty proud of himself, right? He, he was thinking... He was smelling pretty good, right? He begins to list to God, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Man, God, you broke the mold when you made me. (laughs) I thank you. Then he says, he begins to list his works, right? I fast twice a week and I tithe of everything that I get. Now I want you to see this, this little stick figure illustration, okay? So this is what's happening in his mind, okay? He's like, look, God, 
you and me were over here, right? Yeah, you're holy. You're like, you're like that much more holy than me. That tax collector, he is like way over there. Like, God, it sure is good to be us and to be so holy and to be so awesome, okay? Trusting in his own righteousness. That is his view of the world, okay? Look at that sinner way over there, God. Look, look at him, okay? Do you know how delusional this is? Do you know how absolutely backwards and he wait? So what are, there are two things wrong with this. Number one, he way overestimates his own righteousness, right? Way overestimates his own righteousness. But two, simultaneously, what is he doing? He is way underestimating God's righteousness, okay? Not even close. Like, he's like, me and God, we're like, he's, sure, he's holier than I am, but, you know. And that guy, he's way over there. But what is it in reality, in reality, yeah, he may be more righteous than that guy, but the, the, the spectrum, I give this illustration, it is like you bragging to your buddy that you can long jump further than him, okay? In our class a couple Wednesdays ago, I was bragging that I can long jump further than Daniel, Okay, like I would destroy that guy. I could probably long jump. I don't even know what a good long jump is, but let's say, let's say it's like, uh, I don't know, 12, 13 feet. And Daniel, he, he could only do like six feet. It's embarrassing. He can't long jump for nothing, all right? But righteousness before God is the width of the Grand Canyon. The width of the Grand Canyon. You know the Grand Canyon is more than a mile wide in some spots? A mile wide. Who gives a rip if you can long jump six feet further? You can't long jump a mile. So it doesn't matter. You fall short of the glory of God. In other words, you are over here and the worst sinner is still on your half of that spectrum. And God in his holiness is so much higher. He is so much, his thoughts are not our thoughts. He is infinitely holy and perfect. But pride causes us to be so stinking delusional. We overestimate our own righteousness. Listen, Jesus comes along and he teaches, you know when you are blessed? When you hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now why would you hunger and thirst for something? Because you know you don't got it. Blessed are you when you are poor in spirit. That means you understand that there is an inadequacy within yourself that you can't fix. Blessed are you when, when you mourn, when you mourn your sin. Blessed are you when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. Then you will be filled. See, Jesus teaches the, the exact opposite, right? Man in his pride says, I am so holy. Me and God, we're just like that far apart. And Jesus is like, you don't even realize how far apart you are. That's why Jesus will go on to say in Matthew 7, verse 3. Uh, not yet. In Matthew 7, verse 3, he says, don't judge the people around you. Do you not understand that the same measure that you use will be used to other people? And then, and then he says, don't you understand you have a log in your eye? So how on earth could you possibly get the speck out of your brother's eye? Because you have a log in your eye. Now, we know this is a pretty familiar part of scripture. What is Jesus saying? By comparison, that God is going to call you and use you to get specks out of other people's eyes, 
okay? The Holy Spirit of God is going to be working on your life and exposing your own sin in your own life that it is like a log. And guess what? Every one of us has it. That's the way Jesus tells the story. He says, everyone has a log in their eye. Get rid of that. The Holy Spirit's job is to make you aware of your sin, okay? First, deal with that, and then you will be able to help other people. But in comparison, the Holy Spirit will deal with you in your own sin. The mark of a mature Christian is someone who is more and more and more aware of their sin. When I came to faith at 15, right, I thought I had like a handful of bad things that I had done, those times I had lied, those times I had snuck out or done something. I would, and, and then I went to Jesus and I was like, could you forgive me of those and then I thought, I'm pretty much, I'm not going to do those things anymore. I'm going to be good, right? You had this small handful of list of things that you thought you had done. But in reality, then I got saved and the Holy Spirit was inside of me. And as I walked, you know what the Spirit of God began to do? Expose. Go into corners and nooks and crannies of my heart and just begin to expose. You become more aware of sin. It's pride that you will be like this Pharisee who's so foolish and is like, I'm glad I'm not like that guy. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 5 20, He says, Listen, unless your righteousness far exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Then he goes on to say, the scribes and Pharisees, everything that they did was to be seen by other people. When they gave, they did it in a flashy way. They blew a trumpet. They made sure to ring a bell. When they prayed, they only prayed on the street corner. They never did it in private. They only wanted to pray so that other people could see them. And when they do pray, they use many, many words as if they're eloquent, theological, long words is going to impress God. But it's all so showy. And when they fast, they didn't even wash their face. They wanted everyone to know that they're fasting. Yeah, they're fasting twice a week, but they're doing it for other people's approval. You know what's so awful about God? Or you know what's so awful about pride? You can do all of those religious things and do them completely on the horizontal level so that everyone else thinks you're holy and in your own heart not care one rip about God himself. Not care one bit that there's a loving God that pursues you and gave his son for you. That's why when Jesus showed up, the Pharisees didn't even care. They didn't even recognize him. The son of God, God himself is standing before you. They didn't recognize him. In fact, they put him to death. Pride causes us to be that delusional, to overestimate our own righteousness and vastly underestimate God's holiness. Let us not be like that. Will you pray with me? Oh, King Jesus, we thank you for your word and this incredible parable that just tells us a story, God. We know that, uh, that self-righteousness and that it creeps into us, even after salvation, that it creeps into us. And how often, God, we, uh, we spend so much time comparing ourselves, thinking we're so much better than other people. Father, forgive us of that. Forgive us of that. God, you are holy. Your son was crucified on our behalf so that we might know you and walk with you. My goodness, give us a hunger and a thirst for righteousness and humble us so that we will be teachable and approachable. Remove pride from us, please, God. Expose it. Expose it so that we are not like this Pharisee who's so selfish and off-putting, thinks he's so much better than others. God, I pray that that is not us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.